Welcome back to Talking Development. This is a mini-series of podcasts by Concord Europe. Concord is the European NGO Confederation for Relief and Development, and we represent over 2,600 NGOs throughout Europe. Um, together, we try and advocate for a more fairer, more sustainable Europe in the world. Together with me is Gina Wharton. Welcome, Gina. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Gina, you are working a lot in Concord, and we get to that later, uh, but mostly you work as an advocacy advisor for the European network of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Um, for people who like acronyms, that is IPPFEN. Correct. Um, in Concord, you're joining several working groups, which are, you know, e you're working on EU delegations, mm -hmm. you work on EU by regional cooperation, and most notably, maybe because this is our subject of the day, you're working on the Cotonou group. Um, And we will get to that in a second for sure. Your main areas of expertise are the EU development policies and funding. Uh, you work on EU-Africa relations uh, with a focus on women and girls' rights, on sexual and uh, reproductive health, and um, on gender equality. EU-Africa relations, um, what kind of relationship do you see as an ideal Uh, on the contrary to, you know, isolationism. The EU relations with Africa is built on two policies, two different policies. On the one hand, there's a joint Africa-EU strategy, which is the partnership between the EU and the members of the African Union, with the African Union uh, member states are those including the sub-Saharan African countries, but also the northern African countries. And the second policy which guides EU-Africa relations is the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, which is a partnership between the EU, as said, and the 79 countries from Africa, Caribbean and Pacific. You might ask the question, what's the difference between the members within the ACP um, group and those of the AU? Under the ACP group, there's only the governments of sub-Saharan countries. Mm -hmm. So for I will answer your question on the basis of the Cotonou Partnership Agreement. But before that, I would like to maybe give a few words of explanation on what is the Cotonou Partnership Agreement. Mm -hmm. As I said, as I explained, it's a framework between uh, EU and ACP, 79 countries. It's also a legal binding agreement, which is important because it allows to keep the both parties accountable to their commitments. It's a framework which is based on the, which aims at eradicating poverty, but also at integrating ACP groups of states within the world economy. It's an agreement which has been signed in 2000 and will come to an end in 2020. I understand that your question on EU-Africa relation is more future looking. So you mm -hmm. might wonder why I would like to base my answer on the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, noting that the partnership agreement might become obsolete given that it will end in 2020. The reason is quite simple and I would like to answer via an expression which is do not throw the baby out with the bath water meaning that under the Cotonou Partnership Agreement in its Article 2, there are a set of fundamental principles which guides, defines the type of EU-Africa partnership. And these principles are notably equality, the importance of equality of partners between both partners. Secondly, the ownership. So it's important for each country, ACP countries, to own programs that will be programs of policies that will come out of the cooperation. Another fundamental principle is one of participation. It's important not only to have a government-to-government -government participation, but also to include other actors such as the private sector, society organizations, local authorities, etc., etc. The importance of dialogue, so policy and political dialogue. Effectiveness also, so the fact of um, bearing commitments, meeting the commitments, which leads to obligations. So the fulfillment of obligations are also very important in order to keep governments accountable. A last fundamental principle is the one of the tailored approach, given that the ACP region, regions, mm -hmm. talking about three regions, are diverse within the region of itself, taking Africa, for instance but also between the regions as there are 
low income countries, there are middle income countries, there's also landlocked countries, but there's also islands. So policies must be adapted to these realities. Although these fundamental principles have been captured by Article 2 of the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, both parties do not abide by them. I would like to give just two examples very rapidly. Um, equality. So the EU often finds itself in the driving seat in terms of defining the kind of policies. And, um, and therefore, both parties are not always on the same footage of equality with regards to defining what are these party errors. A second example is the participation of all. It's a very governmental to governmental um, relationship dialogue, mm -hmm. which does not, which is not inclusive of all actors. For instance, society organizations often the space for society organizations is often closed or limited. Besides these fundamental principles that will define or should guide the partnership, there are other uh, principles to be observed, notably the leave no one behind, which is a key principle under the sustainable development goals. Leaving no one behind means that you have to also take into account the needs of vulnerable groups such as women, young girls, people uh, living with disabilities, LGBTI communities, etc., etc. Another key principle to observe is the coherence between policies. So for instance, if parties will take up or develop policies in, in the economic area, it should not have negative impact effects on the development area. So they should be coherent amongst themselves to ensure sustainable development. The human rights approach also is very important to safeguard uh, human rights and, and also fundamental freedoms. Um, within the partnership, the partnership should not only be focused on economic and political angle, but also should include the three dimensions of sustainable development, which are economic, social and environmental. Mm -hmm. And finally, the whole importance of aid aid for development and not for other political priorities which fall out of the scope of development. Right. Um, let me pick you up on one subject that you raised, which is participation and specifically, you know, participation of people like us, NGOs, civil society. We know that um, we are always, you know, struggling to have our voice heard, uh, despite the sound ideas that you just mentioned. Um, and now, as far as I understand, the Cotonou Agreement is coming to an end. Now we have a chance and try and influence the upcoming <coughs> relation between EU and Africa uh, so that civil society might have more of a say um, in that relation. So um, how can we push for this space for us? Indeed, uh, society organizations, this, the reality is that there is growing criticism um, towards society organizations, but also the space of maneuver, the enabling environment, as it's called, uh, is restricting uh, for CSOs, but also for human rights defenders. It's essential for the EU and the ACP groups of states to protect the space and the role of CSOs and also to put human rights and fundamental freedom at the heart of their partnership. The experience that I have um, as a member of the Cotonou uh, Working Group of Concord is that although the role of CSOs and CSOs as an actor has been recognized within the Cotonou Partnership, this recognition has not been translated in reality. So there's a gap between what is written in the articles, Article 6 of the Cotonou Partnership, and, and the implementation, so what's the reality. In order to respond to these gaps, to, so to ensure a meaningful participation of society organizations, there are some concrete mechanisms that have to be created secured by the EU and the ACP. 
just to name some examples or give some examples, there is the need for transparent and accessible information in order for society organizations, but also for citizens to take up a meaningful role, they need information to be part of the policy dialogue and political dialogue. Other mechanisms could be also consultation. Yes, one could say that consultations do are already in place and do exist, but there's a difference between having consultations, so tick the box exercise, and having consultations of quality. And this is what has been missing, is a quality consultation of CSOs and citizens to hear their needs, their opinions, mm -hmm. but also to take them into consideration in their policies. Finally, another mechanism could be the monitoring and accountability because CSOs have a role as watchdogs to monitor parties when it comes to their commitments and to keep them accountable. Mm -hmm. So the setting up of such mechanisms will allow society organizations and also the citizens as a whole to take up the role, the different roles, the roles of implementers, watchdogs, uh, service providers, actors of democratic governance. But as a starting point, what is important is of course, the need for, of, of a political will. So in order to create such mechanisms, there must be a real will of leaders, EU and ACP, to, to create such spaces and ensure mechanisms for CSOs to be able to play their role. And also they need to ensure administrative and financial support mm. to make it happen. Now let's assume we do have this support and let's assume we do have our say. Um, if it, you know, were up to you uh, and you could decide, okay, we live in a globalized world, we have those partnerships in place, uh, we are facing a whole lot of, you know, problems that cannot be solved from, from one region, let's say. Um, what are the main areas that you would uh, say we have to tackle in our partnership with Africa? Well, before all things, it, it is up to the EU and the ACP to define their main areas of uh, cooperation for the future. The EU and the ACP are currently pursuing negotiations, notably to define these main areas. Official negotiations have been launched or were launched in uh, September 2018 in New York and significant progress has been made. Notably, they have, both parties have agreed on the guiding principles uh, for the future framework agreement. They have also agreed on the structure, what kind of structure this future agreement should, should take up. So they have agreed on a regional approach, meaning the EU Africa pillar, the EU Caribbean pillar and the EU Pacific pillar with a common foundation, a foundation which means basically uh, a set of um, principles and um, guiding um, priorities that will run through the pillars. However, the upcoming negotiations will have to look more into depth on certain issues which might be contentious mm -hmm. or might create a divide between both groups, being trade cooperation, migration, or sexual and reproductive health and rights. Sexual reproductive health and rights is part, is one of the areas which is part of human development. So human development encompasses education, health, and social, um, social inclusion. With regards to education, education, everyone recognizes that education is key. Mm -hmm. And given the growing population of Africa, the EU has the tendency of really focusing on vocational education training and the development of skills. However, I would like to encourage both parties to ensure the universal access to education, so at all layers, be it from the childhood, the primary, secondary, tertiary education, university and skills and vocational education training. With regards to sexual and reproductive health and rights, this all that's a thematic which is controversial at the current moment, notably because um, the sexual orientation and sexual rights are contested as it's criminalized in uh, some African countries. 
So for those who are not familiar with what is sexual and reproductive health and rights, is the right for a person to have the control over their body, their sexuality, um, who they would like to get married with, how many, the spacing of children, so the whole family planning uh, angle as well. It's the liberty to make choices, for you to make the right choices for yourself uh, with, without uh, being pressured or, or being subject to um, violence, for instance. So I see that, um, you know, there's a lot of suggestions that you're making going forward, but also I, I wonder, you know, what keeps us going as CSOs working in this field is, um, you know, looking back on what we have achieved. And I think in, in your career, you might have come across a lot of, uh, you know, success stories as well. Maybe you would like to sh share some of those. Yes. Um, from the top of my head, I will think about the situation of Mozambique. Mozambique stands out as a, as a very liberal country in terms of policies uh, on SRHR. IPPF uh, has a member association, which is called AMODEFA. AMODEFA is doing a great job in Mozambique, but in a very uh, challenging context. As in Mozambique, um, half of the young girls below the age of 18 years old are pregnant. Also half of the young girls in Mozambique below the age of 19 are married. And there is also a high uh, rate of in HIV infection in uh, Mozambique. There is a high need for farm planning in Mozambique. However, Mozambique has been hit by the reinstallment of the Global Gag Rule in January 2017. The Global Gag Rule denies US funding to organizations that use non-US funds to provide abortion services counseling or referrals in accordance with national law. The consequences of the global gag rule on AMODEFA are massive. So AMODEFA, although is doing a great job, due to the global gag rule in reinstallment, had to close half of their clinics. These clinics offered services, free services, to young people. This example illustrates the impact of negative non-progressive policies on SRHR on people's needs and people's lives. In comparison with the US, the EU is doing a great job when it comes to SRHR. The EU is champion SRHR mm. and does not shy away from developing uh, progressive policies in SRHR. I would like to re make reference to a, a recent initiative which was um, created by the EU in a um, multi-year partnership with the UN agencies called the Spotlight Initiative, which is a 500 million euro initiative to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls. Mozambique is one of the countries which could benefit from the Spotlight Initiative and address violence against women and girls. Referring to the evidence in the State of the African Women report, one out of three women experienced violence in their life. In Africa, close to half of women experienced some kind of physical or sexual violence. Violence against women and girls is a violation to human rights that should be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are, you know, actual policies in place that uh, will hopefully steer us in the right direction. And you've, you know, you've mentioned a lot uh, about the EU-Africa partnership being a, on an equal level. Yet, if I were to go out and speak to people who are not that involved in this, Discourse. They might still have in uh, this image in their mind that you know um, help for Africa means um, you know I'm giving money to charity on Christmas. Um, how would you respond respond to this image? It's true that this image is um, still existent today. I mean, we could see it also through campaigns on television, the Help for Africa uh, call to uh, citizens. But this is part of an old discourse which uh, finds its roots in post-colonialism. Mm. 
The Help for Africa echoes or portrays um, by binary dichotomy uh, relationship. For instance, um, dichotomy between donors and aid recipients, rich and poor, or developed and underdeveloped. However, the reality is such as Europe and Africa have moved away from this, that, from this aid for Africa. Today, the aid for Africa has been replaced by equality of partners, so partnership of equals. I will also make reference to the following quote from President Juncker, who, which demonstrates this shift of paradigm. He says that Africa does not need charity. It needs true and fair partnership. And we, Europeans, need this part partnership as much. So it's a, it goes in both ways. Some European policymakers might also refer to a win-win partnership, meaning that both Europe and Africa could benefit from this partnership. Others will also say a win-win-win partnership. The last win makes reference to the inclusion of people, of citizens, the win-win mm. between governments and the win-win-win will include the people. Right. However, this win-win-win approach is yet to be seen as um, the partnerships should be more inclusive of people, so should be a more people-centered partnership and should also put human development and environment at its heart. Mm -hmm. um, let's say we have people who agree with what you are saying right now, um, watching out there, listening to us, and I assume we do. Um, the difference between, you know, uh, giving charity and the, the complexities of, you know, those partnerships which you are describing is that um, the latter feels very, very hard to grasp for everyday people and voters who are not that engaged in the subject. So I'm wondering, um, you know, what it li actually does lie in our power in order to influence these relations for the better? Yes, definitely. The power lies uh, in the hands of the voters. Those, the voters will have to cast their, their vote uh, in May, end of May to elect um, the future parliamentarians, European parliamentarians. It is therefore important for citizens to be knowledgeable of the power that they vote will give to a European parliamentarian. As we all know, parliamentarians are, represent European citizens and are the voices of citizens, are there to ensure that the needs and the asks of citizens are addressed through policies. According to the 2017 barometer, 91% of Europeans believed that promoting gender equality was a key value, something of importance. Mm. Gender equality indeed has been taken up by the EU within its policies. So the EU has strong policies to mainstream and to implement gender in internal and in external actions. However, noting the upcoming changes with the, the new, newly elected parliamentarians and also the commissioners in September and October, things could change. So EU policies in EU gender policies might, might not retain the attention in the future. In order for the attention to remain on gender, European parliamentarians can demand, raise questions to uh, the Commission to have more clarity on how gender policies are implemented and to see whether these policies are implemented effectively. Another power of uh, parliamentarians is the budgetary control. So parliamentarians vote the EU annual budget, but also the multi-annual financial framework, which is a fancy name, all to say the EU long-term budget for seven years. 
basically the European parliaments could decide on the amounts that will be alloc allocated to a certain priority. So if a citizen, citizen's interest as the barometers have shown it is gender, then the European parliamentarians who support gender also mm -hmm. could influence by their vote the allocation to gender. Finally, the European parliamentarians also within their respective committees develop reports and resolutions in which they ensure that the needs and the ask of citizens are addressed uh, through political measures and policies. Mm. So I see there's plenty of reasons for us to seek out those politicians whom we trust um, to represent um, our interests um, and our ideas. Um, thanks a lot, Gina, for being on the podcast. It was a delight. And thank you all for joining Talking Development and we see you next week.